So I want to begin this video by saying that this is not indicative of all people of a certain race uh, or anything of that nature. I want to make that crystal clear that I am not trying to come down harshly on any person or people or people groups or anything of that matter. Uh, because I don't believe that all black people have a mentality of uh, victimiz uh, victimization. I think that there are lots of great um, black people over on our side uh, that that don't give in to this uh, uh, continual perpetual victimization mentality. And I am glad that we have the, those type of people on our side. And so again, when I start this video, I'm not trying to be disparaging or to malign anybody of a certain race or color or anything of that nature. It's just a uh, general look over the, I guess, a general disposition of people of, uh, well, really of a certain, of, well, I can't really say race, but really people of a certain disposition uh, and a certain mindset because it's not only, in, uh, it doesn't only include black people. There's, uh, all, you know, there's a lot of other people uh, who want to continually uh, victimize their, themselves or uh, spread their, how should we say, their own woes and uh, say that it's due to some type of systemic uh, racism or system that has been built against them. And so I just want to make this crystal clear. Again, I am not trying to disparage anybody, um, but I hope that if you fall into a group like this to where you think that that the system is against you and that uh, slavery is a ongoing and continuing issue to this day. I hope that maybe uh, something that is shared today will uh, enlighten you and open up your viewpoint a little bit more and uh, and maybe it will change your mind. But without further ado, on with the show. If you were to Google slavery today, and take a look at the pictures of what would populate underneath the search, you would ironically find only pictures of black slaves. Let's say that you were an alien visiting Earth for the very first time, and you decided to use our unbiased search engine. And I know you can't see, but I'm using air quotes on, around that. But if you were to use this unbiased search engine, you would think that it was only black people who were slaves. However, I know that my audience is neither alien nor so ignorant to believe that slavery only belonged to America. But if you were to use Google and believe all these whack job teachers that are out there, you would think that slavery is an American only sin, but that could not be further from the truth. The bias that is permeating our media, education, social media is very, very disgusting to me. It gives our darker skinned fellow Americans a reason to be angry. Slavery in America is a distant memory and quite frankly, gives our government purpose for trying to expand their reach. Let's take a look at this article that is dripping with toxic bias and rhetoric that is poisoning our nation because people are so bent on dividing us. This article comes courtesy of Forbes magazine by Raimundo Pierce. I'm just kidding. His name is Raymond. The article is, What is Gained by Denying America's Original Sin? It reads, Our nation's long and sad engagement in the atrocious business of slavery has long been referred to as America's original sin. The dehumanizing obscenity and, and transatlantic enterprise... American slave business is set it apart from any other form of enslavement known in human history, causing President John Adams to say Negro slavery is an evil of colossal magnitude. Now, as we go through this, I really want you to pay attention to the tone of this article, because, because this tone that's going through this article is going to be the very mindset that a lot of our fellow American uh, uh, black American brothers, this is the a lot of their mindset that that they have concerning slavery, and this is a lot of what the the new left, the Democrats' ideology behind 
uh, slavery, that it is an American only institution, that that it is something that is our original sin, that no other nation bears this type of sin, and that the that America, the founding, is flawed. And so I want you to really, really pay attention as we go through this article. The apt metaphor of sin raises the obvious question of repentance. Clearly, denying the magnitude of slavery and its lingering effects on this nation is not the road to true repentance. And it does not help shed us of that demon that occupies a place within the soul of our nation like a persistent cancer. Such a demon has no place in the soul of a nation dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. So my question then is what can we do to achieve true rep repentance? Because if having the bloodiest civil war here in the US, uh, or excuse me, a bloody civil war here in the US, I can't really say for certain who had the bloodiest civil war, but nonetheless, it was a very bloody civil war that we uh, here in the U.S. fought. We had the Civil Rights Act. We've had affirmative action, which, by the way, is racist. And we even had a black president who did nothing for the blacks and for, uh, for all these people of color for eight years, and that still wasn't enough for these people. Now let's move on. Even after the Civil War, half the nation instituted systems and laws aimed at preserving as much of the tenets of slavery as possible. Even those who managed to escape this new form of slavery were subject to the racist Jim Crow laws intended not only to prevent black people from achieving any kind of equality, but also to reinforce the notion that black people were inferior to whites. And yes, I would actually like to remind Mr. Raymond, who was in charge of the South when those Jim Crow laws were instituted, which I say it was the Democrats. Remember that the South, for a long, long time, were Democrat-controlled states. Let's move on. Today, Far too many people argue that America's original sin of trafficking and enslaving human beings does not matter. That all this is in the past, and we have an even playing field now. They argue that as a nation, we have done enough. They say it is time to end programs aimed at redress and stop talking about racism once and for all. To which I agree. And I'll tell you why I agree with this. Because the truth is, is that as much as they want to make us to be a racist nation, who, I mean, honestly, who, who is really truly racist? I, I mean, it's, I'm not saying that there's nobody here that, in the U.S. That is, that is not racist or that we're completely uh, immune from any type of racism here. I mean, but for real, how many people do you know that are actually racist. I mean, if you were to ask a racist, are you racist? Well, what do you think they're going to say? Well, yeah, of course I'm racist. I mean, the, the vast majority of people aren't going to admit that they are because most people aren't. But let's move on. I would like to ask those people to at least recognize the reality of America's long history of slavery and how its effects came to be a part of the American fabric. I would ask them to stop denying the continuing effects of slavery and its detrimental impact on generations of Americans. Listen, they cannot stop advocating about America's original sin and how we all need to make up for it. So now the question has to be asked, how do we make up for it? Well, allow me to elaborate through this article. It is difficult for me to comprehend how anyone cannot see the vestiges of slavery and Jim Crow in the ongoing inequity in the education of the United States. Oh, we're getting close. Discriminatory housing policies and practices of black families with lower incomes are concentrated in neighborhoods and schools in those neighborhoods tend to be underfunded and underperforming. Here, let me give you a translation. We need more money. Look at these examples. But rather than take 
that affirmative action, we are now seeing a movement to water down and diminish the horrors of slavery and its lingering effect on the construction of our nation. Indeed, there was never a time when this country did not struggle vehemently against the sinful presence of slavery. Yes, now we don't struggle with slavery now. Nobody has slaves. Nobody is being held back. Not no, no black people, no Indians, no Latino people. Nobody is being held back. The only reason why people are being held back is because they want to. You give them an excuse to not rise to, to be the best that they can. Look at the Vietnamese of what they did, what they were able to accomplish here in just seven short years. When they came here after the Vietnam War in 1975, we had Vietnamese that knew nothing. They didn't know our English. Uh, they didn't know our English language. They didn't have the education like we did. And yet now, if you see the Vietnamese uh, population, the Vietnamese uh, people, especially, what is it, over in, uh, I believe it's California and in Washington as well, you'll see that the Vietnamese are above the, uh, the median income uh, uh, over there in those, in those uh, states, that they're doing exceedingly well because it was hard work that allowed them to, to ascend. So my question is, what's going on with, uh, with the, all these other people that are here in the States that do have the opportunity for education, that do know our language, and yet they're, they're uh, languishing away uh, their lives and, uh, and uh, making all sorts of excuses and saying that, oh, it's the system, man, it's the oppression, it's, it's uh, white supremacy that's keeping us down. Well, that's a lie, because if that was true, then that would, uh, would also, in turn, have kept the Vietnamese uh, refugees that came over here in 1975 down as well. But let's move on. The social detriments of education framework recognizes the ongoing impact of laws that were specifically designed to keep people of color, usually African-American people, in low-paying jobs, in underfunded neighborhoods, in rented homes rather than in homes they owned, and in a perpetual state of being second-class citizens. It recognizes that because of the impact of these laws, the people of color in the U.S. often are not able to receive the same quality of education as their white peers. B S. Stop feeling sorry for yourselves. Again, I, I mean, we could point to so many examples. What about the, the immigrants from Africa who come here and they do exceedingly well? Well, what, what about the, uh, the Japanese who came here and, and do well? The Chinese who came here and do well uh, and continue to do well? And they, they had, they've all had the language barriers. They've all had the barriers that these, that these people who have been born here in the United States don't have. And yet we, they just want to be angry and keep talking about the social detriments of, of, our, of slavery that's been interwoven into the fabric and the founding of the United States. Oh, it makes me so angry. We must examine the range of disparities and challenges students and their families face, from poverty and food insecurity to inadequate health care to housing discrimination and work together to address them head on. We hope that policymakers will open their eyes to a very real legacy of racism in the country and the impact it has today and to adopt policies that we like-minded organizations recommend for using addressing these problems. Problems which should have been resolved long ago. Perhaps then our country can start to truly repent of its original sin and we as a nation can heal and move forward towards a brighter and more equitable future where all can pursue life, liberty, and happiness. So again, what is this author reiterating? What do we need to do? We need to give more power. We need to give more money to make the problem go away. And let me tell you this right now, that no matter how much power and no matter how much money we give to the government, this problem will never ever go away because people are still going to continue to be lazy people are still going to continue to depend on other people to provide for them 
And the only way that you're ever going to make yourself a better life for yourself and for your family is if you quit making excuses, go out and get a better education, better yourself, learn some type of a skill. I mean, my goodness, they act like they can't get onto YouTube and learn from uh, you know, some random Indian guy. I mean, th you have uh, all sorts of guys that are on there that can tell you how to code uh, and, uh, or, you know, or learn some other skill set and make a better life for yourself and get a, you know, get a better education. Instead, they turn to uh, being uh, hoodlums or making excuses or just being completely dependent on the welfare system. And stuff like this is absolutely infuriating. Well, anyway, there will never be an end to it, as I, as you can see clearly from this example in the, in the article that I just read. We fought the bloodiest war here in American history, and that still wasn't enough. And as we will see later on, America and Britain were on the cutting edge of the world in abolishing slavery and helping rid the majority of the world of its problem. And notice I said majority because slavery... Which, by the way, where are the voices crying out about this? But slavery is still a prevalent problem today. As I mentioned in my last video, slavery was a human institution. It wasn't only black people that languished under slavery. As Thomas Sowell puts it best, no other historic horror is so narrowly construed. No one thinks of war, famine, or decimating epidemics in such localized terms. He goes on to say that it is those people who push this tragedy all onto one race are those who are critical of a Eurocentric view of the world when it comes to the evils and failings of the human race, meaning that it's not, nor should it ever be limited to a view to where it was only whites who enslaved blacks or responsible for all the evils of the world. The view is historically inaccurate and it pushes a disingenuous narrative to where liberals are able to pin the woes of the black Americans on systemic racism and white supremacy. Come to us and give us more power, they will say, and we will give you money or reparations, as they like to call it. Dr. Sowell goes on to say this, The instrumental use of the history of slavery today also underlies the claim that slavery grew out of racism. He later explains that for centuries, people didn't have the technology or the wealth to go around to a different continent and to capture people and to transport them en masse to across the ocean. Whites enslaved other whites, blacks enslaved other blacks, Arabs enslaved each other and then everyone, and the Asians enslaved other Asians, and yes, Indians, those peace-loving ones with the, that are one with nature and had the matriarchal society you know that the leftists love to point to their advanced civilization well they enslaved other indians as well oh and by the way i was being sarcastic about the matriarchal thing because that's what the leftists claim it's total hogwash slavery goes as far back as mankind it didn't descend from racism rather it came from how vulnerable people were in other words the strong preyed upon the weak and the rich preyed upon the poor it was never based on skin color, or if somebody had a darker tone of skin. They were thought to be inferior because of it. That ideology didn't even come around until later, even by the time Columbus arrives on the scene when he ran into the natives in the Caribbean, he thought that they would be just as capable as the Spanish were. However, long before that, people had simply enslaved other people based off of how accessible they were in terms of location rather than any preconceived prejudice. Such notions had come from the 20th and the 21st century Monday morning quarterbacks who, by the way, are still wrong in their assessment of these people. The Balkans were being enslaved by other Europeans and Arabs at least six centuries before the first African was brought into the Western Hemisphere. As we can see, before people were enslaved for being a different color, the Europeans were being enslaved in North Africa by Muslims for being Christian. It would have been much more likely for someone to be enslaved based off of a different race, caste, religion, or tribe, and such boundaries have nothing to do with skin color. And besides all of this, white men could not live in Africa very long. As Dr. Sowell puts it, 
a white man was much more likely to catch malaria than to catch slaves himself. The average life expectancy of a white man in the interior sub-Saharan Africa was less than one year. So for those who have been brainwashed into thinking that Africans were chased and captured from their homes by white men to be forced here to the States as a slave is a lie. This leaves only one viable and logical option, that stronger Africans and African tribes preyed upon other weaker Africans and African tribes and sold them to white men where they would in turn be sold in other countries as slaves. Oh, and do you remember that stupid movie the liberals were raving about in 2022, The Woman King? Well, it turns out that they were some of the biggest slavers in Africa. Ah, leave it to the left to tout a terrible, diverse, female-driven movie without knowing the true history behind such people and the atrocities that they committed, only for them to act like they deserve to be praised because of the position the women held. But hey, woman power, am I right? Either way, slavery was a cultural norm to the whole world, and not just specifically to America, Britain, and to Europe as a whole. If you look at the etymology of the word slave, you would find that it was derived from the word Slav, who were Eastern Europeans who were often taken as slaves. Also, as one last side note, in his book Breaking the Chains by Martin A. Klein, it says on page 10, that even at the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, Africans retained more slaves for themselves than they sent to the Western Hemisphere. Ending slavery was one of the most arduous tasks that earlier people had faced. In order to do so, it had to be routinely attacked and questioned for many generations. To change people's minds and the outlook on what was thought to be a cultural norm all over the world. Ironically enough, when the leftists and the blacks today want to blame the white man for their woes, the ideology behind the destruction of slavery began in none other than Britain in the 18th century, during a time that the British Empire had expanded its reach into many colonies over the seas in the Western Hemisphere and was completely dependent upon slave labor. From Britain, even places like France and the United States began to develop a distaste for slavery. It wasn't going to be stamped out overnight, and it had to be continually attacked over the course of many years with countless men bearing the torch of freedom and passing it to the next generation in hopes that slavery would one day be reviled. As we, in the 21st century, are able to look at slavery through our high and mighty ivory towers and to look down upon those who committed it back then, having thoughts like that was very unpopular and even backwards to many, and I mean the thoughts of liberating the slaves. And though the Europeans and the West had in the 18th century become the leading slave traders, by the time the 19th century came, they had become the destroyers of slavery. Many opposed this new viewpoint of anti-slavery, including Arabs, Asians, and yes, even the Africans themselves, because where were they going to get their money? On August 1st, 1834, Britain abolished slavery. Not only had the British stamped out slavery in their own empire, which consisted of about a quarter of the entire world, but they had also begun pressuring others to follow their lead in their quest for freedom. In 1849, British warships were given permission to destroy Portuguese and Brazilian vessels that were used in the slave trade. They later pressured the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim empire by the way, no sacred cows here, to end their African slave trade. They even threatened the Ottoman Empire and the Mediterranean Sea to board their vessels if they didn't do a better job at policing their ships to enforce the ban. We will get into more of the West and the Europeans' hatred for slavery in just a bit, but I want you to listen to this contrast in the attitudes of the people's reaction when slavery was banned. As Dr. Sowell brilliantly points out in his book, as the novelist Machado de Assis recalled that the celebrations following the passage of the Golden Law, the Brazilian ban on slavery of May 13, 1888, were the only instance of popular delirium that I can remember having ever seen. One Sao Paulo newspaper described the crowds that gathered to celebrate, to try to describe the splendor of the Festival of Joy, to tell everything that happened falls beyond our abilities. Never has this capital seen such multitudinous and unanimous enthusiasm. 
Now let's contrast this to the reaction from the Middle East or the Ottoman Empire at the time. In 1855, when the Sultan's Furman was read out in Mecca and Jeddah, it caused a revolution. Turkish officials, including the Qadi, who read the Furman, were murdered and the garrison shut and Mecca was in a state of revolt until the port repealed the obnoxious order. And when the Governor General of the Hejaz issued orders on the 25th of February 1860 forbidding the slave trade in all Turkish ports in the Red Sea, there was great excitement and fear of the reoccurrence of the 1855 violence. There was no Ottoman cruiser in the Red Sea capable of giving effect to this order, and the Turkish officials were too frightened to enforce it. And this is just one example of Europeans taking a stand not only to their own detriment and their own empire, but also in other parts of the world to try to stamp out slavery. Of course, in 1861 through 1865, the U.S. fought the bloodiest war in our history to stamp out slavery and ultimately cost an estimated 620,000 soldiers their lives, countless limbs because three out of four surgeries that were performed were amputations and President Lincoln his life in order to free the slaves. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln announces the Emancipation Proclamation and finally, after a fight that had begun well before the founding of the United States, was, per was partially brought to an end and would finally end when the Civil War was won by the Union in 1865. And I will go over this in greater detail in a later video. And Dr. Soul continues and says, Later still, Americans stamped out slavery in the Philippines, the Dutch in Indonesia, the Russians in Central Asia, the French in their West African and Caribbean colonies, Germans in their East Africa colonies often hang slave traders on the spot when they caught them in the act. It is hard to imagine what would have happened had not the West and ultimately white men not stepped up and abolished slavery. But the crap that the white people get today is absolutely astounding to me. You don't need to feel bad for something your ancestor, your ancestor may or may not have done. Reparations are not needed for our black American brothers, and certainly no boot kissing is required. This is the Lord's work right here, man. This is the Lord's work right here. And this is a good white woman, man. She's showing her deeds, man, to the Lord, man. And, and the, the most I may show favor. Here it is, right here. There you go. This is the white man. Get these white women and get these white people a hand, man. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Keep on coming, Mr. White Man. Keep on going. Please, don't do this. It's disgusting. It's unsanitary and it's completely unnecessary. It's not the Lord's work to degrade somebody for something they never did, they never committed, and they likely will never commit. So if you wanted to get mad at slavery, why not get mad at the slavery that is still happening today where there are untold millions who are still facing slavery in this world instead of crying about how good your life is being free right here in the United States. It's not perfect. But the opportunity to rise in income is unrivaled by any other country in the world. So I'm sorry, black folks and others who want to lump yourself into the victims category, but slavery happened over 100 years ago and can't continue to be your excuse as to why you're not faring well here in the United States. There are plenty of black folks who have taken advantage of the opportunities right here in the United States and have risen out of poverty and you can too. And I will mention again the Vietnamese immigrants who in 1975 after seven short years were able to prove that the, the perpetual victims of our day wrong, that they came here knowing nothing, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way, but they had fled Vietnam, they didn't know our culture, they didn't know our language, and today they are some of the most successful people groups here in the United States. So. Here's what to do when somebody wants to call you racist. Ignore them. You're not racist for being white. You don't owe anyone anything for the sins that were committed in the past, and you certainly shouldn't fear any of the warm, boring monikers that anyone wants to throw your, your way simply for you being white. Because the charge against slavery was largely led by white people. And so again, I want to make this crystal clear. I'm not trying to disparage anybody. 
I'm not trying to disparage anybody of a certain color or malign anybody of a certain color. And nor am I trying to say that just because white people are white, that makes them intrinsically or inherently good. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm trying to do is just get across a viewpoint of where uh, people, uh, particularly white people, are so denigrated today uh, because of their skin color, which is racism, by the way. It is absolutely racism uh, against these uh, white people when, again, they've never owned a slave. And, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people here in the United States would be... Uh, wouldn't wouldn't support slavery they would be fully against uh slavery and so why are we continuing this type of a conversation i i really don't understand but again it's not just to say that just because you're white means that you're you know automatically a savior or anything like that and just because you're black it automatically makes you a victim that's not what i'm trying to uh you know to to paint that's not the picture that i want to paint but simply a accurate uh, historical viewpoint of what slavery was and uh, what, what it came to be here in the United States. And we will get into uh, the slavery that did take place here in the U.S. Uh, in, a, in, a, well, in a video uh, further down the road, because it wasn't just white people that, uh, that enslaved black people here. There was also the uh, Native American Indians that also enslave uh, uh, other blacks as well as their own kind. In fact, there are even other white slaves that were here in the United States as well. So that's a, a you know a piece of history that a lot of uh, leftists and sensationalists don't like to really talk about. But I believe that it needs to be talked about to get a broader picture and a full viewpoint of of the context of slavery and what took place here in the United States. Uh, slavery was not good. It was, it was an evil that uh, descended upon our nation uh, and it had no racial boundaries. Uh, it hurt everybody uh, here in the United States. And that's really all that I'm trying to do is uh, show people that it wasn't just one race that was enslaved. Uh, everybody was enslaved, uh, every, every person of every, or I should say every race, uh, at least at one time or another, was enslaved. Um, that's, that's what I mean by that. And, um, and I just would like to, uh, you know, to show that, uh, you know, it's not just uh, the black people that have had a difficult time here uh, in the United States, and nor should it be something that, uh, that people, uh, wherever you're at, uh, and if you try to claim some type of victim mentality, uh, you shouldn't let that um, dominate your life because we have so much opportunity and we have so much freedom um, to rise here in the United States economically and to make a better life for ourselves and for our family. So I do hope that uh, this helps you. And uh, for those of you who might be feeling bad about something that happened in the past, don't I would say don't worry about it. There's nothing to, uh, there's nothing to it anymore because it's not, uh, it's not us. It's not you, uh, and and I hope that we're able to all walk away with this uh, with our head held high, um, knowing that yes, you know what, there was uh, the sin of slavery here in the United States, uh, but that sin was also uh, paid for in blood and uh, uh, particularly throughout the Civil War. Um, and so I think that we're able to really take all of history in per into perspective and, uh, and look at the broader picture and see that, you know, we have done our fair share to rid ourselves of the, the blight of slavery from here in the United States.